friends, happy Thanksgiving, and welcome to Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a game about meeting your boyfriend's folks for the first time. Oh, just imagine you are sitting there with your boyfriend's family, and it's very awkward because they have no idea who you are, and you have no idea who they are. So, <laughs> do not bring up politics, do not bring up your relationship, or how far you have gotten with their son. <laughs> And do not bring up religion. Also, do not bring up the 49ers. His dad is a big fan. And he won't shut up. So, let's play. Back in high school, he skipped class to go to an aquarium with this guy from English. You never really talked to him after that. It didn't go so well. Oh. You don't think about it all the time or anything. But it was the first proper date you went on. Let's go to the proper date. But never mind. What's one date amongst everything else that has happened? Don't think about everything else. What matters is now. You're 21. It's dark in here. Five hours since Austin. And you're... Oh, uh, yeah. And you're in open country. Occasional lit-up billboards blur past. Advertising immigration law or lawyers and outlet stores. And, uh, Evan... Eh... Evangelic, evangelical churches, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> this is set in Texas. Ugh. <laughs> You're in the passenger seat, silent, while Tommy drives. You okay, Casey? The soft drawl jolts out or jolts you out of your thoughts. Maybe you'd better, or maybe it'd be better to pretend to sleep, or reassure him that you're okay. Yeah, of course you're okay. I'm going to pretend to sleep because I am not okay. The passenger window rumbles against your shoulder. Tommy does that short sigh he does when he's worried. Lately, he's been doing that a lot. It was his idea for you to come to his, or to come to his for Thanksgiving. You didn't really want to go, but he talked you around. And, well, now you're on your way. Tommy draws to a halt at a gas station. And you wake up a little. There's a conversation about majors. He's in pre-med. You're going for philosophy. You're doing pretty well, and considering everything, you could be doing a lot worse. After a while, Tommy's words blur with the quiet music, and you don't even have to pretend to sleep. Tommy's climbing out of the car, and there's talking and laughing outside. You drag yourself out of the dimly lit drive. What? <laughs> it's time to get that smile going. Tommy's dad, or Tommy's dad's hugging him, and his mom's peering through the dim light toward you. Casey, she calls out. Oh my word! Come here and let me take a look at you. Your palms prickle. Come on, you used to be able to meet new people, no problem. You should have done your homework before heading out there. Casual, like the ah shucks thing Casey normally goes for, or the polite Texan college student. Oh, sir and ma'am, hell fucking no, I ain't changing my ways, I'm doing it casual. You grin and stride forward to hug her. Christine, it's amazing to meet you. She gives you a, or she gives you this look, narrow and searching. And did you do something wrong? Maybe you should have said something else. Maybe you're dressed wrong. Maybe she thinks you're not good enough for her son. Mr. Lewis finally releases Tommy. That's Officer Lewis to you, Casey, he says, laughing like it's a joke. Officer. Officer Lewis. She's a cop. Officer Lewis. She's a cop. Oh, you messed up. Why did you never ask Tommy what his mom did for a living? Dad might have been arrested all the way across the country, but that doesn't mean the cops can't find you. You're never safe. You're so stupid. Uh-oh, she's watching your face. Maybe she recognizes you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, sure, the trip was great. <laughs> I didn't even have time to read that. If you guys want to read that, please pause it and read it for yourself. Well, haven't, haven't you got good luck, Christine says. Tommy, how about you come help me with the bags? Mr. Lewis booms jovially that you shouldn't have to drag things out in the dark 
and starts to steer you indoors. But Christine's murmuring something to Tommy. Well, oh wait. Uh, Tommy, how about you come help me with the bags? You wait a minute, listening while they haul bags out of the trunk. Where'd you meet Casey again, honey? Mom, don't get all... I'm not. It's just that there's something about... Casey? Mr. Lewis is watching you now, and Christine and Tommy have gone quiet. Come on, kids, he says. Tommy does this yelp you've never heard him do, and starts protesting that he's in college. He links arms with you uh, as you trail indoors. The warm, bright indoors smells of coffee and something sweet cooking in the oven. Mr. Lewis shows you where everything is, and of course, of course you must make yourself at home. Of course you must. A couple of minutes later, and Tommy follows, lacing his fingers with yours. We're a little tired, Dad. It was a long trip. Good-natured com er, complaint. Wait, good-natured complaint from his parents. Part of you wants to go upstairs right now, even if you can't bury your head in a pillow and wait out the holiday. But what would Dad say if you didn't stay downstairs and do your homework on his, on this family? Oh gosh. Uh, we're going to go upstairs. <laughs> a flurry of activity. Tramping, up, or tramping upstairs, downstairs, sorting out bedclothes. Finally, it's quiet. Tommy's room is small and partially packed up with stacks of boxes filling up half of it. The window is clear and pictures and posters still line the wall next to the bed. Uh, look out the window, I guess? A pool of amber light spills, or spills from the downstairs window, showing a shadowy garden edged with tall trees. On the porch, Christine smokes a cigarette. You duck backward. Tommy's at your side and touches your arm. Thanks for coming, he murmurs. The, alternate, or the alternative was your tiny college room, and as hard as this is, maybe you could have, hand, or could have handled being by yourself, but maybe you should have stayed. Avoided all. All. He turns to, co or to contemplate the bed. It's a single with a pale yellow coverlet. They've set up a mattress beside it along with a mountain of pillows. So, uh, Tommy says, gesturing vaguely. Do you want the bed or the floor? I'm okay with, what or with whatever. Uh, I'll take the bed. You take off your shoes and perch on the edge of the bed. Getting changed feels odd, even though you've undressed in front of him hundreds of times. Once you're in, Tommy smiles up at you from the mattress. Mind if I come up? Being here is making you feel edgy, so maybe it would help. But maybe you're not in the mood. Yeah, come on. It's a squeeze to fit, but no more than you've dealt with before. He's warm against you and puts an arm over your chest. It'll be great tomorrow, he says, his voice blurring with his breath on the back of your neck. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Your mind starts to wander, but with Tommy so warm beside you, it can't run too far. You sleep. Sleep. Doorbell. Doorbell. Crash. Get the door! Kids, or kids high voices and stamp, stamp, stamp upstairs. Maybe you should get on the mattress to look respectable. Or maybe you want a little more rest. Let's look more respectable. You shove the quilt aside and set up on the mattress like you spent the whole night there, seconds before a cluster of kids stampede into the room. Tommy, Tommy, squeals one of the smaller girls, and she jumps up and down on his feet. Whoa, whoa, easy there, he groans before surfacing, looking ruffled but cheerful. The girl points at you. Who's that? Tommy grins. Well, maybe Casey can make introductions. You haven't hung out much with kids, but surely they're like adults? Be friendly and they'll like you? Or maybe it'd be better if you didn't form too many attachments here. Let's be friendly. The name Casey is really starting to get on your nerves, but you smile and do the cheerful thing, asking about all their names, though you didn't really pay attention. And eventually they file out. Sorry about that, Tommy says. They're way too excitable. You dress and freshen up in the bathroom, and Tommy leads you to the breakfast room. So many people. Christine and Mr. Lewis, turns out his name is Jeff, bustle around serving coffee and a big group of old folks uh, cluster around Vera, Tommy's great aunt, 
and Tommy's cousin and his wife, Brandon and Angela, and a whole bunch of kids here for the day to see this branch of the clan. One of the girls is busy dragging around Vera's retriever, who looks as long-suffering as any old dog in a room full of people. Coffee tastes sweet and sharp. Tommy gets cooed over. He gently pulls you forward, and surely you can get over yourself. You're not even shy, really. You can deal with it, or maybe you're not up to it. Just get over yourself. You get over your, or you get yourself into a position where the light can hit you right, and you shake hands and grin like you've never had before. If you think of it like the jobs you used to do with Dad, then it's easier to think of the right thing to say, easier to watch for tells. Vera and the great uncles and aunts certainly seem like or seem to like it, and Brandon and Angela nod attentively at what you're saying. While Brandon's getting coffee, Christine grabs his arm and mutters something to him. But maybe it's better to listen to Jeff, who's trying to get Tommy's attention. Ah, let's listen to Jeff. Now, Tommy, Jeff calls out. It would be just great if you and Casey could help us at the grocery store. We'd love to get to know you better, Christine says, and her thin smile doesn't meet her eyes. There's no, or there's no saying no, but you couldn't or act enthusiastic, or maybe it's not worth it. Yeah, let's act enthusiastic. Okay, or fine. Okay, cheerful face. Jeff beams at, or beams at you as if he didn't really care how you feel, but Christine, you can tell what Christine's thinking, and you don't like to stare at her too hard. Otherwise, she may pay too much attention. Who are you kidding? You're going out with her son. Of course she's paying you attention. Maybe you can make a good impression. In the car, Jeff asks you all sorts uh, from the passenger seat as Christine silently drives. Surely he must know all this stuff from Tommy, but apparently hearing it from you is done th- er, is the done thing. Facts are okay. You met Tommy during orientation, and you asked him out right away. But when it comes to opinions, it's hard to remember what you've said and what you haven't said, or er, what you haven't and what you've said to Tommy. Surely, you've said to Tommy that the reason you chose philosophy is that you wanted to follow in Mom's footsteps. And surely, he said he loves the woods, and you've said you love the open country, and that you enjoy curling up with a good book. But then, sometimes he glances at you, and Jeff just carries on talking so you, can, or so you can't get a moment to think. Eventually, you arrive. The grocery store is a low, long building on the edge of town, and the parking lot is filled with cars. Christine checks her watch and cuts Jeff off from his latest line of questioning. We're headed to the hardware store. You two? She asks, or she says, can you pick up the groceries? You got cash? Once they're out of earshot, Tommy slings his armor on your shoulder. Sorry about dad, he says. He's just excited I'm bringing someone home. Pause. Hey, how did you sleep last night? You looked a little distracted. Your mouth tastes a little dry from all the talking. But at least it's only him with you. You could be honest if you wanted. Though, maybe you don't. Yeah, let's be honest. Your breath's coming okay. And the warmth of sleep next to Tommy helped. But this whole thing is totally new. And you wouldn't call yourself comfortable right now. You can't tell him why his police officer mom with her too knowing stare makes your vision prickle with static. But you can tell him it's weird being here. Or that you hope you do okay in front of his family, but telling him about it won't fix it. Brushing it off and spinning a lie would be easier. No, let's just say that I hope I do okay. It relieves a bit of the tension in your chest. He rests his hand on the back of your neck for a second before you head into the store. Tommy leads you around. All you need to do is follow with the cart and tick everything off the list. Yams, marshmallows, bourbon for Vera, extra tinfoil for the turkey. Out of the corner of your eye, you check the newspaper stand in case, of, uh, in case any of Dad's old friends have been caught. Nothing yet. Every so often, Tommy pauses to say hi to old neighbors and does the introduction thing. You wave and ask how they're doing. Eventually, you're at the checkout. Ahead of you is a middle-aged woman with a scraggy gray haircut, having having a quiet but heated disagreement with the teller. I'm sorry, ma'am. It's being refused. Oh my god, Tommy whispers. 
That's Miss Lane from the ranch. Should I give her some of our money? She looks like she's in trouble. You've pulled out, or you've pulled this one a hundred times. Surely you could tell if she's trying uh, the same. Either way, Tommy's bound to take your advice whether you step in or ignore what's happening. Let's step in. You pluck a chuck of bills from Tommy and hand it over. Miss Lane opens her mouth, closes it again, and says, Oh my word, is that Tommy Lewis? You're so tall, and who's your friend? This is Casey, Tommy says, smiling and nudging your shoulder with his. Happy Thanksgiving, Miss Lane. She, or her lined, tanned face flushes. You have no idea how much that means. She pushes her card away, humming tunelessly. Tommy's face suddenly falls, and, sur- and he surveys your groceries. We'll have to skip the bourbon, he says. But never mind. Thanks for doing that, Casey. Too many security cameras around to stash the bottle, so you'll have to go ahead or to go with it and head outside. Christine and Jeff wait for you outside, bearing heavy bags. You get everything? Jeff calls. And Aunt Vera's bourbon, right? Tommy glances at you. Not the bourbon. Miss Lane was in front of us, and she didn't have enough money in her account. Well, that's very nice of you, Jeff said in a tone clearly proceeding. But Christine shakes her head, and as you follow them to the car, Tommy looks crestfallen. It was you who went for it, so maybe you should put in a word. On the other hand, it was his idea, not yours. Maybe it's best to stay out of it. Let's put in a word. Gotta stick up for my man. It's Thanksgiving, you point out. When it's the... Er, when is when is it the time to be generous, if not a holiday? Hmm, Christine says and puts the radio on. Still, Tommy squeezes your knee and shoots you a smile. He leaves his hand there for the journey back. Back at the house, the rest of the relatives are bustling around downstairs. Jeff and Christine shoo you out of the kitchen, and the relatives descend on Tommy, demanding who he wants to spend time with. Laughing, he glances at you. What would you like to do, Casey? All eyes are on you. There's Tommy's great aunt Vera and the kids and Brandon and Angela. Or maybe you'd like some alone time. Uh, let's spend time with the kids. One of the boys punches the air, nearly taking out a bowl from the counter. Tommy herds them towards the door and the others troop out behind you. They introduce themselves all in a jumble. Stevie, Paige, Leela, Corey, Mackenzie. Mackenzie is the eldest, maybe 11, fast talking and fast moving, <laughs> and pointing out the exact point she fell over when arriving this morning. Paige is the smallest, and Tommy holds her hand as you head out to the sunshine. We're going to the park. Oh, oops, we're going to the park, Tommy says over his shoulder to the group. Now, let me just see. He bends to pick up a battered yellow frisbee from the porch and hands it to Paige, who meticulously examines it. The dog bit it, Leela tells her. Gross. Tommy rolls his eyes at at you and whispers to Paige. The road's quiet, and you quickly make your way to the edge of town and to the park. The park's quiet, too, though you pass the occasional dog walker and hassled-looking adult with a few screeching kids in tow. I hate the outside, Stevie says in a glum tone. When you mention how you prefer to sit in a coffee shop, he scuffs his shoes. Oh, great. Now, on the grass until Tommy leads you to an open space. While the kids scatter, Tommy whispers, you don't have to pretend to them. Stevie won't care what you think about the outdoors. Hey, come here. He throws the frisbee from one hand to the other. Can I tell you a secret? He says, I am terrified or I'm terrible at frisbee. But I tell you who's good at it, Casey. Leela gives you a level stare. Go on then, I can take you. Stevie sighs and looks wistfully towards the trees. Do we have to run around? Can we sit a bit? Yeah, let's sit a bit. A little way past the empty baseball diamond, the seven of you settle, Mackenzie and Stevie laying on their backs and watching the occasional clouds. You see that? That's a fish, Tommy says to Corey, pointing. That's you, Mackenzie says to Stevie, who's giggling, and says, No, it's you. They say it back and forth, over and over. Kids are ridiculously patient when they want to be. What do you see, Casey? Leela asks. The wind, er, the wind's getting up. If you make your eyes fuzzy, you could see a bunny, though it's teenious. Or, tainous? I don't know. I'll just say, Oh. Oh. 
Oh, how cool. Okay, uh, I see a dragon. A dragon? Really? Leela says, not all that impressed. What kind of imagination is that? I see it, Tommy says, voice soft. He leans back and slings his arm over your shoulder. Mackenzie giggles behind her hand. Leela snorts and then gives you an appraising look. You're doing philosophy, right? I'm going to study museums. Pause. Then, how come you're not at your own house, Casey? Where are your parents? Tommy gives you an uneasy glance. You don't have to answer that, he tells you. Why? Why? Casey's story doesn't involve crime or jail or any of that. Usually, you deflect those kinds of questions, though sometimes you tell Casey's lie. Yeah. This is so weird. <laughs> you tell the grass under your feet that your uh, that your parents need to sober up before you want or before you'll want to see them, and the kids sit in stunned silence. Kicked you out after high school? Are both dead? Uh, yeah, I need to sober up. Right, Tommy says too brightly, scrambling to his feet. Who wants sodas? He bends to kiss your cheek, and his breath tickles your neck. We'll be back in a minute. Surrounded by the kid or by the children, Tommy strides away toward the play area, giving you st- space to think. This trip, this whole thing. If someone told you before that you or that you and Tommy'd be hanging out with a bunch of kids or a bunch of his kid relatives in a park, you'd have probably ignored them. Thinking about it now, the heat of the nearly noon sun is starting to drag your mind. Drag your mind slower. Casey? Casey! Tommy's voice is sharp and fearful. There's only four children with him. Leela ran off and didn't see where, er, and we didn't see where. His breath was ragged. I don't know what to do. There's no one around. Do you think you could, I don't know, do you think you could look or, or look while I watch the others? Jogging in the direction of the play area, Leela reminds you a little of yourself when you were little. Sharp-eyed, withdrawn, and... A, not a small con artist, of course, but there's similarities. Where would you go if you wanted to be alone? There's the bandstand, and under the climbing frame, a war memorial, and a weird fountain you passed on the way, probably underneath the bandstand. The bandstand's tall and ornately carved, but you were counting on there being a space or beneath it to hide, and it goes right to the ground. The only creatures around here are crows. Go to the fountain. The fountain's made of geometric blocks sta- or stacked together in an unpleasantly gra- gravity-defying way. The tiled floor is lined with coins. You call Leela's name, but no answer. Okay, the memorial. It's a tall bronze statue of someone from World War II with a long list of names. And sitting there is Leela, arms folded. Oh, she says. She clearly has no intention of moving. Maybe guilt would work or asking what's wrong. Or pulling rank as an adult and simply ordering her to come with you. No, asking what's wrong. She scowls at the floor. I wanted to be by myself a bit, okay? Is that so weird? You wait. We had to move house, she said in sort of a growl. Mom and Dad got in this, or got in with this creep who stole their money. And now they're angry all the time and I hate it. Her voice trembles and a tear drips off her nose. She stumbles to her feet. Fine. We can go now. As soon as you're in sight, Tommy dashes to you and hauls Leela into a tight hug. She starts to explain, and he says, No, don't worry about it, sweetheart. I'm just glad you're safe. Come on, let's go home. On the walk back, Tommy entwines his fingers with yours, his hands damp with nerves, and he keeps rolling his shoulders as if to free them from tension. Thank God you were here, he mutters, and squeezes your hand so hard it aches. Back at the house, they're... Uh, they're bustling in, or they're bustling in preparation for lunch. The children scatter noisily, but Tommy hangs back. Just a second, he says. I need to speak to Brandon and Angela. More noise from the kitchen. Everyone's assembling to eat. They're in the parlor and edging toward the door. You hear Tommy softly telling them what happened with Leela. Brandon murmurs, oh, Jesus, while Angela says through her teeth that she'll have a word with Leela about appropriate behavior. When Tommy emerges, he nearly collides with you. Oh, I thought you'd gone. Come on, I'm starving. The turkey smell is overwhelming throughout the house. 
Even the enchilada you scavenge from the kitchen tastes of it. Cheese sandwich, cup of coffee, chicken salad, uh, bread and spaghetti hoops, takeout leftovers. No, let's do a cup of coffee. Tommy leans against the kitchen island and watches you while he eats a sal- or salad sandwich. Aunt Vera glances approvingly at you every so often and gets Paige to... Uh, to pour you several glasses of lemonade. <laughs> the children are constantly coming to demand that you answer questions about like or th- about things like your favorite color and animal. Brandon and Angela chat away with you and Tommy, asking how you're doing and making sure you're comfortable. Christine dips a serving spoon into a simmering pan of pumpkin soup and advises or and advances on you with it. Taste? Or would you like to try Tommy? Let's taste it. It nearly burns your tongue, but the taste is sweet and spicy. Tommy just loves that soup, Christine says. What's your comfort food, Casey? Did your parents make you anything special when you were little? Uh oh. Oh, uh, spaghettios. Hmm, Christine says. Good to know in case you visit again. She doesn't sound all that keen on the idea. Lunch is starting to draw to a close. Leela and the rest of the kids are set to mo- or for a movie marathon this afternoon, but there's Tommy's great aunt, Brandon and Angela, and Jeff and Christine invite you to hang out with them while they cook. Uh, sure, let's hang out with them. The turkey's roasting in the oven, and Jeff starts chopping potatoes while Christine fries bacon. Jeff hands you a knife for the yams. We're doing mashed yams with, pe- or with pecans, he says. Family tradition, get chopping. Tommy, grab the maple syrup, will you? Chopping the yams, you get into a rhythm while Jeff and Christine talk over Tommy's head about their friends and the schedule for the rest of the day. Christine glances towards you. Hey, Casey, where did you say you were from? You tell her Santa Clara, Georgetown, Sweetwater, Cedar Park. Oh, let's do Cedar Park, which may not be true for you, but it is for Casey. I thought that was what Tommy said. I don't suppose you remember Officer Trimble. Uh, you don't remember. Could betray you. Oh, gosh. Christy shrugs. Of course, she says. She did used to scare the teenagers half to death, though. I'm surprised you don't remember. You're about to mention a fabricated memory of this person when Tommy cuts in. I'll go grab some oregano from the garden, okay? The air is cooled now. And as Tommy pulls you toward the herb garden, he says, I know you prefer things quiet. I'm sorry Mom's giving you an interrogation treatment. He leans towards you. You could kiss him or give him a hug or carry on with what you're doing. Let's kiss him. His hand snakes up into your hair, and when he breaks away with his teeth glimmer in a smile, he bends to grab a sprig of oregano. We should probably get back indoors. Thanks, honey, Christine says to Tommy, giving him a peck on the cheek. Between her and Jeff ordering you around like a pair of sous chefs, you don't have much chance to talk. Slowly, the meal comes together and the rest of the family start to congregate. Dinner's up, Jeff bellows for benefit of the uh, dawdling relatives upstairs. Brandon asks you for help setting the table, but Jeff says you're the guest of honor, so shouldn't or so you shouldn't have to do anything. Uh, the table lies before you. Should you wait till Tommy's sitting or take a seat? Let's wait till Tommy's sitting. You stand at the edge of the table trying to look like you're about to sit down while waiting for Tommy to finish setting out napkins and warm plates. He meets your eye and gives you a small smile. He probably realized what you were doing because he lays his hand on a chair and announces, Me and Casey are going here. Dad, can you grab a couple glasses? You want a beer? Jeff calls. You normally don't drink alcohol. Too little control. And maybe going along with what Jeff says would be the best or would be the thing to do. You ask for soda, beer, water, wine, juice, cider, Pepsi. Uh let's do Pepsi. And Tommy clinks glasses with you. The table's ready. Before you lies a feast. Green beans, mashed yams, uh Sweet potato casserole with pecan topping, cornbread, pumpkin soup, glazed carrots, garlic mashed potatoes, squash soup. I bet you've never had a spread like this, Casey, Jeff booms. You haven't. Vera and the other great aunts and uncles have clustered together and are having a chat about the sunsets over Las Vegas. Though the rest of the kids have been uh, packed off to their parents for dinner, Leela's still here, sitting between Brandon and Angela and... 
syrup or syrup. I don't know what that word is. <laughs> uh, feeding the dog bre their breadsticks. Christine bears down, carrying the huge turkey and carves. What did you do for Thanksgiving over in Cedar Park? Jeff asks as he passes Christine the cornbread platter. Thanksgiving rituals feel odd, so you keep it generic. Luckily, he gets distracted lecturing Vera on the casserole flavor, so you can keep focused. The talk surges on. Dessert is a vast uh, apple pie with ice cream, and the table's even louder. Brandon's had a few glasses of wine, and he's got the stabbing finger for emphasis stage. He turns a wobbly gaze to you. So, what we've all been wondering, Casey, is if you'd ever want kids. Christine leans forward, resting her chin on her hand, eyeing the two of you. Tommy grips your arm tight but says nothing. Layla puts her, he or her head on one side. Yeah, but why would you want to have kids if your parents are like drunks or whatever? Silence. Anyway, Brandon says, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> so how to even be how to even begin to answer? Yes, and Tommy might think you're coming on too strong. No, and he might be disappointed. Maybe, and you look like you're scared of commitment. Uh, yes. The words stuck in your throat, worse than usual, and your fork clinks against your plate. Tommy nudges his foot against yours under the table. Well, Jeff says, I think it's great that you're studying something that you're passionate about, especially taking inspiration from your mom like that. Marvelous, Vera says, nodding with approval. Jeff beams. And now that we have a toast, or now how about we have a toast? Casey, why don't you do the honors? Last time you made a toast was in the weird conference where you and dad were pulling a job on a CEO. Uh, here's to, here's to love. You lift your Pepsi and the others join around the table or those around the table join in. To love, applause, and stamping. Tommy throws his arms around your shoulder. Vera rises. Now we've got a surprise for y'all, she says. Time for the fireworks. Outside, darkness has fallen. Vera and the other grandparents start setting up in the garden while Tommy leans against you on the porch. The fireworks burst in sparking colors that burn when you blink. Leela squeals with delight at each explosion. You stand outside a little while feeling the air on your skin until Christine decrees that you should head to head inside to bed. Wait a minute, Tommy. Christine calls. Can you help me in the kitchen? He gives you an apologetic grimace and goes along. There are murmurs from behind the door, and maybe it would be better to just go upstairs, but Dad would be so angry if he missed out on listening. On good information. Tommy, I've had to make nice for the holiday, but I'm really not sure about Casey. All the, or there's all these stories, and they don't add up. And I just, aside from Tommy, Mom, you just don't get it. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. Footsteps towards the door, and he emerges. Oh, were you listening at the door? He shakes his head sharply. Never mind. Let's go up. And here you are once more, in this small, cozy room, now lit by an orange-tinged bedside lamp. Tommy turns to watch you. Mom is being annoying. He rolls his eyes as or as if you know what it's like for a parent to complain about a partner. I like you, Casey. I really do. I hope coming here was better than staying at the or in the dorm room. Maybe it was. He steps closer. Tommy carefully lays his hand on your shoulder, running his finger to, or fingers up your neck. He was that, or he has that warm look in his eyes, like he wants to kiss you, but is waiting until you're comfortable. I love you, he said, or he says, soft, and your throat freezes. Say something. Say it back. Laugh it off. Say something. Voice doesn't work. What would be best? What would work? Say something. What's right? Nothing. Say something. Tommy's not frowning. It's okay, he says. I get it. You don't have to say it back. I know things are difficult with you, but I'll be here. It'll be okay. It won't. Someday along the line, you're going to, you're going to hurt him, whether you kiss him or step back. It's who you are. You're now, or you're kissing now, and everything muffled. Everything's muffled and quick, and at least you don't have to think anymore. And it's not going to last. Nothing ever does. But at least for now, there's this, this, this. Ending two o four. 
Sweet. Gaining support from your significant other. You survived Thanksgiving dinner. Tommy loves you, even if you don't quite know how to handle that. Although you got most of your story straight, Tommy noticed you bending the truth a little, though he didn't mind. Okay, so that was Thanksgiving, guys. If you want to go play the game yourself, it is free. I found it on itch.io, and I went under the Thanksgiving tag, and it should be the first game there. So if you wanted to go play it yourself and see what kind of ending you get, or if you want to go through all the endings. So... <laughs> that is all for this episode, guys, or this video. So thank you guys so much. And if you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up down below. And if you haven't already, subscribe. By subscribing, you're becoming part of a legacy. I love you guys so, so much. And have a very happy Thanksgiving and blessings to all of your family from mine. So yeah, bye-bye.